I bring you greetings today from the Florence International Church in Florence, Italy. I'm Pastor Randy McGeehy, and we are very, very thankful today for the privilege that we have of sharing these moments with you. We trust that you have had uh, some wonderful moments in your celebrations of Christmas and that you have felt the presence of the Holy Spirit in all that you have been involved in. And we trust today at, that you will continue to feel his wonderful presence and look to him for every need in your life. Today from Psalm chapter 90 and verse 12, we find this verse of scripture that says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. As well from Matthew 6 chapter and the 33rd verse, we find this instruction that says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. You know, there's an old saying that you are never too old to learn. <laughs> Sometimes I think we all question that thought in some fashion or manner, but in reality, I think we can all agree that there is truth in that. Here is one of the lessons that you're never too old to learn as an example. From Psalm 90 verse 12, teach us, teach us to number. Number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Now what that really means is this, teach us to number our days and recognize how few they are and help us to spend them as we should. Someone has observed that life is like a, like a monetary uh, bill of some kind, some paper money as an example. You can spend it any way that you want to, but you can only spend it one time. Now when you spend money, there are really only just those thoughts to really, really focus on. You can waste it or you can invest it. The same thing is true with life. Now whether you are young or whether you are advancing in years, six or 60 years, healthy or and wealthy or puny and poor, you can make the rest of your life the best of your life. Suppose you were starting life all over again. You are old enough to know right from wrong. You are old enough to learn old and old enough to, to love, old enough to really live. If you could ask the Lord Jesus Christ how to make the rest of your life the best it possibly can be, what do you think he would say? I don't think we have to wonder. I think that I know what he would say. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I think you can summarize what Jesus said here in three words. First things first. Now I know that sounds simple, but I want to tell you that if you, beginning today, would consciously, continuously, and constantly put first things first, it would absolutely change and transform your life. The formula for now to do just what is found in this tremendous statement from the lips of our Lord is very special. 
And I want us to think today for just a few moments about what that really means. The first item that I would bring before you would be that we need to set proper priorities in our life. Now, everything rises and falls in this particular statement. If your priorities are not in order, your life will not be in order as well. If your priorities are not right, you won't be right. You don't have to pray about what your number one priority in life ought to be. You don't have to think about it and ponder it and debate it. You don't have to discuss it even. You don't even have to look for it. You just have to do it. Because Jesus has already told us what our first priority ought to be. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. That's it. That should be and must be our first priority if our life is really going to accomplish what it is meant to do. The word seek means to actively pursue or to go after. It's in the present tense. It means continuously. Every day of your life, you ought to seek first the kingdom of God. Now, in order to seek the kingdom, you must first seek the king. That just goes without debate. You can't have the kingdom without the king. The first priority of your life ought to be to seek the king of the kingdom. Did you know that the Christian life is more than just accepting the Lord? It's a life of seeking after the Lord. The Lord is not just someone you passively accept. He is someone you actively seek after. I can tell you something about your relationship to God at this very moment without even knowing you. I can tell you how much of God you have. You have, quite frankly, all of God that you want to have. God does not have any favorites, but he does have intimates. James 4, 8 says, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. God has promised in his word, And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. But it is not enough to seek the Lord. You see, we must not only seek him, but we must seek him first. We must make him a priority. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. First means first, putting the Father first in our lives. There are three words that I want to circle in this passage. In verse 30, circle the word faith. In verse 32, circle the word Father. And in verse 33, circle the word first. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews eleven six, without faith it is impossible to please him. Do you know what faith is today? Faith is putting the Father first. Let me tell you something. Jesus does not want a place in your life. Jesus does not even want prominence in your life. Jesus wants preeminence in your life. Jesus wants the first moments of every day that you have. Jesus wants the first day of every week that you have. Jesus wants the first part of every paycheck that you have, which is the tithe. He wants to be first the Lord Jesus Christ is not interested 
in being the first runner up in your beauty contest. He is not interested in being vice president of the corporation that you seemingly have. He's not interested in being second in command in your army. He wants to be the king on the throne of your heart, not a co-partner in a duplex. But not only are we to seek the king, we ought to seek the kingdom. The kingdom of God ought to be the obsession of each of our lives today. The word kingdom there literally means rule and reign. A kingdom is a place where a king rules. To seek the kingdom of God is to seek the rule and the reign of God over your entire life. Now when you truly seek a king and you truly seek his kingdom, you are automatically seeking for three different things. First, you are seeking for the glory of the king. Every part and parcel of your life, every minute and moment of your time, every ounce and pound of your strength, every muscle and every fiber of your body ought to be given for the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. But it means also to seek for the guidance of the king. A loyal subject always wants to do whatever the king would have him to do in this moment of his life. There's no higher calling in life than to find out what your king wants done and then to go about doing it. Every morning of your life, you ought to begin by asking the Lord what Paul asked of Jesus on the Damascus Road when he said, Lord, what would you have me to do? But it also means to seek the government of the kingdom. A loyal subject desires to be controlled by the king, to be governed by the king, to be ruled by the king. Someone might say, why you are talking about slavery, pastor, may I tell you that the greatest liberty in the world is found in being controlled by the right master. Has it ever occurred to you that if you will, if your will was what God's will was always to be done in your life, then your will would always be done. I heard about a woman who was deathly sick. A neighbor came to visit her and he asked her whether she wanted to live or whether she wanted to die. And she responded and said, I just want whatever pleases God. The neighbor said, well, what if God were to refer the matter to you? Which would you choose? And she responded again. And she said, if God were to refer the matter to me, I would just refer the matter back to him. <laughs> that lady had her priorities in a good position, in the right place. And it should speak to us as well in this moment. You can believe this or you can choose not to believe it, but it would be better to die in the will of God than for you to live outside of God's will. The second point that I will make today is seek personal purity. Not only are we to seek his kingdom, we are to seek his righteousness. 
That is, not only are we to be seeking God's control over us, but we are also to be seeking God's character within us. The kingdom of God is not only to be inwardly experienced, it is to be outwardly expressed. You see, if God is ruling over you, then his righteousness will be within you. Because a man's character is simply the outward expression of whatever is controlling him inwardly. Faith is always seen by its fruit. Character is always seen by its conduct. Proverbs 20 verse 12 says, The hearing ear and the seeing eye the Lord hath made even both of them. You see, as we seek the kingdom of God, people ought to be able to see the kingdom in us. We are never going to make a difference in this world until the world sees a difference in us. A German philosopher was the, the what was particularly the philosophical founder of the Nazi movement in Germany back in the 1930s. He was the first man in history to come to the conclusion, a wrong one, but a conclusion that said God is dead. And he came to that conclusion by looking at Christianity. This is what I want us to understand. Do you know what he said about Christians? He said, if you want me to believe in your Redeemer, you're going to have to look a little more redeemed. You see, the real mark of a Christian is that he makes it easier for others to believe in God. Now what does it mean to seek the righteousness of God in our life? First of all, we must desire it. We do what we really want to do, and we are what we really want to be. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. You ought to desire to be right, to do right, to live right, just as much as a hungry man desires food and a thirsty man desires water. Next, we must derive it. We are to seek his righteousness. God is not interested in your righteousness per se. He is only interested in his righteousness. God is not interested in what you can do for him. He is interested in what he can do through you in your life. It will be a great day when you learn the difference between self-righteousness and the Savior's righteousness. Paul, after he was saved, made this one of his goals in life. He said in Philippians 3.9 that he wanted to and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. I want you to learn a lesson about righteousness today. Righteousness must be imputed before it can be imparted. Let me make this very clear and simple. Before you can live it, God must give it. And that is exactly why Jesus came and Jesus died, that we might have the righteousness 
of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 reads, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We must also depict it. We ought to live like kingdom subjects. We ought to live as examples of what it is to be a true believer and follower of Jesus Christ. The third point that I will make is we need to see promised prosperity. Now the Lord says that if you will seek his kingdom and his righteousness, all these things shall be added unto you. Now what things was the Lord referring to here? He was talking about all the things that people worry about in their lives. In verse 19, we are told that people worry about finances. It says, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. <coughs> In verse 25, we're told that people worry about food. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? Verse 27 says, we are told that people worry about fitness. Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And in verse 28, we are told that people worry about fashion. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not neither do they spin. Now all of these things that we need, <clears throat> that's why the Lord said in verse 32, for after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. Now the Lord has promised that if you will seek first his kingdom, and his righteousness, you will have all the things that you need in life. I did not say that you would have necessarily all the things that you want. There is a difference. I'm convinced there are four lessons parents ought to teach their children early and that it would be good for even some adults to revisit and relearn those same lessons. First of all, you don't need everything that you want. I wish I had all the money back that I had spent in my life on things that I wanted that I didn't really honestly need. The second lesson is you don't want everything you need. I never wanted one spanking that I ever got as a child but I needed every one of them. The third lesson is God doesn't give us everything we want. I, for one, am so glad that he doesn't. You know, one of the greatest blessings of God is found in those things that <coughs> he doesn't give us. <coughs> Excuse me. I read one of the greatest Blessings of God is found in those things that he doesn't give us. I read one time the confession of an unknown soldier that tremendously blessed me. Listen to it for a moment. I asked God for strength. 
that I might achieve. I was made weak that I might humbly learn to obey. I asked God for health that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might feel the need of God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing that I asked for, but I got everything that I hoped for. Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. I am among all men most richly blessed. <clears throat> the last lesson is God always gives us what we need. I heard about two stories, or stores, I'm sorry, that were across the street from each other. Highly competitive, always trying to get ahead of the other. The manager of one store came out one day and nailed a great big sign over the doorway in front of his store that said, if you want it, we have it. Well, the manager of the other store across the street walked out and saw that sign, thought about it for a few moments, and went back into his store for a while and later came out with a sign he nailed over his store that said, if we don't have it, you don't need it. I can tell you something right now. No matter what you may think, if you don't have it, it's because God knows at this point in your life, you really don't need it. You see, what the Lord was trying to teach us here was this. It's our job to serve God. It is His job to supply us to do that. Now most people have that backwards in their thinking process and in their actions. Most people think that it is our job to supply us and it is God's job to serve us. If they could, they would sing the old hymn that we often knew years ago that says, <clears throat> I'll have my own way, Lord. I'll have my own way. I'll be the potter. You, Lord, be the clay. I'll mold you and I'll make you after my will. While you are waiting, yielded, and still. It is exactly that attitude that cuts off the blessings of God in our life today, friends. You see, in a real sense, we have been called to live from hand to mouth. But that's all right if it's His hand and my mouth. I heard about a missionary who was getting ready to embark to go away to the foreign field of calling. And back in that day, they went often by ship because it was the only form of transportation. And just as he was going up the gangplank or gangway, a friend of his, who was a very wealthy person, came to him and slipped an envelope into his hand that was sealed. His friend said, you take this envelope. And if at any time while you are overseas, you come to the place where you have exhausted every other possibility and you don't see where else to turn 
and have a need that you cannot meet anywhere else, open this envelope. Well, the missionary took the envelope, thanked him, put it in his pocket, and went up the gangplank, and he stayed on that mission field for 20 years. And at the end of 20 years, he came back home, walked down that same gangplank, met by the same wealthy friend, and he returned the envelope back to the man, still sealed, still unopened. And he said this to him, never did I come to a place where I did not know where to turn, nor what to do. His reference was God was for and with him at all times. So in conclusion today, I ask you, do you want to make the rest of your life the best of your life? Many people in these this next week will be thinking about 2021 and they'll be making a lot of promises to themselves or to others about how they're going to do things better than they did in this year of 2020. We call them New Year's resolutions, and most of them mean very little because most of them never come to pass. Let me encourage you. If you want the rest of your life to be the best of your life, Allow Jesus Christ to be your Lord and your Savior with an expectancy of his soon return. Put him first. Live every moment for him. And I can assure you, he'll take care of the rest of the moments that you have to live. Give your life to Jesus today. Would you pray with me? Father, we come before you right now in the precious name of Jesus. First of all, giving you thanks. Thanks that you have created us and given us a life to live with a plan and with a purpose. And Lord, I'm asking today that you help each one of us to seek after you, your will, your purpose, and then go about accomplishing it for your glory. Lord, none of us know for sure what 2021 holds for us. We look back at 2020 and we say, boy, this was a difficult year. I hope we don't go through that again. But the reality is, Lord, whatever the circumstances are, if we live them seeking after you, seeking after your righteousness, we will find ourselves in a position where we will be living in the victory that you created us for. Lord, we want to be faithful in our lives for you. Help us today to determine to make 2021, should you allow us to live that year on this earth or whether uh, you have another plan, whatever that plan might be, help us to be faithful to your will and to your way. And Lord, if there's anyone listening to this message today that has not received you as Savior and Lord, I would just ask your Holy Spirit right now to speak to that person's heart and help them to understand you love them and you have prepared a place and a way for them if they will receive it and give you first place in their lives. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for all that you have done for us, all that you are doing, all that you will do. And may the rest of our life bring glory and honor to you. Amen. Again, we thank you today for joining us here at the Florence International Church in Florence, Italy for this message that we have just received. And I pray that you will think it through 
and allow the Holy Spirit to help you to put it to good use in your every day, in your life, for His glory and for His purpose. Our prayers and our thoughts are with you today for the glory of God. Join us again on Wednesday of this coming week in the morning on our Facebook page, the Florence International Church, for our weekly devotional thought for the week. It will be there in the morning and we'll continue to be there until the next week. So we hope that you will make time to, to uh, receive that word and put it to good use in your life. Remember that every Sunday at 8.45 a.m. Central European Time, you can find us here with God's message for the week. And we hope that you will make sure that you make the effort to tune in and allow the Holy Spirit of God to encourage and challenge you as you live your life for His glory. Again, thank you for being with us. We are blessed. We are privileged to be able to share this time with you. And I hope that today you will determine to make the rest of your life the best of your life for the glory of God.